Welcome to another edition of the Leader Post Rider Rumblings podcast. This is episode number 157. Taylor Shire and Daryl Davis are with you for another chat about the Saskatchewan Rough Riders after the Green and White just defeated the BC Lions 28-19 in the West semifinal. Now they are off to the West final against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on Saturday, Daryl. Yeah, they just want us to keep going on Rider Rumblings, I'm gathering. Hey, Taylor, it's, a, it's been a lot of fun and, and fun following this team because uh, they seem to be getting better. It was a very solid performance on all three in all three facets of the game, offense, defense, special teams. And I gave a lot of credit to Corey Mace. Uh, you know, I've picked away at him a little bit this year because of some of his strategic moves. They've, they've messed up a few things, especially around halftime, and uh, uh, always kind of wondered how he would handle the two hats of uh, – being the defensive coordinator and the and the head coach, because now he's got to make the strategic decisions, and he made the good ones. I, I know that uh, he, he elected to punt into the wind just before halftime, and it ended up costing them seven points. But they couldn't afford to give up two extras, I don't think, in that tight a game. Uh, so it backfired, but I still think it was the right decision. And he's the guy who made sure they had the wind in the fourth quarter, and then also took that two point convert in the after the touchdown in the fourth quarter to give them a nine point lead and in football we all know nine is a magical number it forces your opponents to score twice uh eight and less you only have to score once so i think Corey mace did a really good job of not only preparing the team but of being prepared himself and thinking properly in tough situations during a playoff game yeah in terms of you know the game itself, I don't think it was a, a classic. It's not one that's going to go down in the in the memory banks, kind of like what Durant did in 2013 against the Lions when he sort of put the team on his back in the Western semifinal. So it wasn't one of that, but but I just thought all around good game. They they played well when they needed to. They had two fourth quarter interceptions that obviously sealed the game. And and I think something that it's kind of boring to talk about, but the wind I think was such an important factor. And and the fact that the Riders were able to score when A.J. Olette rumbled into the end zone, I think from 30 yards going into the wind um, was a very important uh, moment in the game. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, having the wind in the fourth quarter, forcing BC to play into it, I think was one of the biggest decisions that goes back to to deferring um, in the first half and, and again in the second half. Yeah, old Taylor Field used to be a wind tunnel, right? Remember it? The wind had just howled through those two grandstands. We're, we've kind of forgotten that we're on the prairies here because Mosaic Stadium is a little bit different. The way it's shaped with the bowl, it's got cantilevers big up, up high in the in the uh, the roof panels that kind of blow the wind by in every direction except south. And in the winter, it's getting closer to winter, and the wind seems to come a little bit more from the south, and that's why it was such a wind affected game because the wind was coming from the south and blowing in the open end of the stadium you talk to brett lother and a lot of the kickers and they say that's the only time that it really seems to affect you and it it did really big play a big part in the game uh you're right the rough riders scoring into the wind was huge in that third quarter uh that's kind of when they took absolutely took control of the game not that they ever lost it even though they were down six nothing after that first possession uh, they they seem to have control in that third quarter, dominating in the third quarter the way they did. Really made sure that they that they were on pace for a victory. I thought it was more entertaining than you did. Evidently, I, you know, uh, we're both in the same press box. And I was sitting up there going, "This is a game I really want to watch," and it, it entertained me quite a bit. I thought it was a, a a fun football game to watch, and I'm also looking forward to this Winnipeg one. It's another good matchup. So it's playoff time. They they do get entertaining, and a lot a lot of those chess moves really come into play. Okay, it was entertaining. I'm not, I'm not taking anything <laughs> away from the performance. I'm just saying it wasn't this this classic that's going to be played on on uh, whatever on loops ESPN over and classics over again, or something. ESPN yeah. classic, mm-hmm. right? It's it's not a classic. It was an overall good game, and and I think again one of the most important things for this team was was just seeing their response. They let BC score on the on the first drive of the game, but then they responded with a couple of field goals and got right back into it. And then I think. A really big moment again you touched on it but it was right before halftime when they punted from their own end zone decided not to give up a safety gave up the no yards penalty all of a sudden bc has the ball at the 22 yard line i think it was yeah scored a touchdown right away they go into halftime um and, and Corey mace alluded to this post game that a drive like that letting letting another team score in a moment like that could take the wind out of your sails and it, he said it has moments like that have in, in previous teams he's been on but the riders didn't allow that to to take the window to their sails. They regrouped at halftime and put together, a, and I would say an outstanding second half. Um, obviously, the third quarter was was big, and then the fourth quarter just to seal it. And, and Vernon Adams 
he talked about a post game. He had to take the shots, right? He wasn't going to play conservative. They were down two scores. He had to take the shots. And, and you see Nelson Lacombo get his first interception, then Roland Milligan basically seal the game with his, I guess it'll be ninth interception of the year. Just a remarkable season for him. But, but for, for those two players to get those two plays at, at those moments were what we talked about leading into the game of, of, you know, making those big plays in those big time moments. And, and that's exactly what they got. Yeah. What do they had? 49 turnovers. I think the defense this year, that that's huge, right? Uh, three, two or three a game they're averaging, which is really pretty impressive for any defense. And uh, they don't give the ball away on offense very often either. And that's what, the secret to the Rough Riders. You know, they, they gave it away one time on a failed third down gamble. I think that we, Shea Patterson doesn't seem to be very effective in that role anymore. So I don't know if they are going to plan anything differently. They did use A.J. Ouellette out of the backfield to score that touchdown. He switched spots with quarterback Trevor Harris. So they've got a few, they had a few tricks up their sleeves, nothing really crazy, but things that were effective. But as you said, the, the uh, defense, which we kind of were expecting in our pregame show when we were talking about it, has been so effective at turning the game around because of, of plays like that that uh, you kind of expected. And Marcus Sales, who, you know, used to play for the BC Lions, gets gets an emotional turnover for him. And Nelson Lacombo, after coming back from a year, uh, missing a year with uh, Achilles and finally coming into the starting lineup, gets his first CFL interception. And then Roland Milligan, you just expect that from him all the time, right? The kind of the dagger in the heart type of interception. Huge turnovers from this defense, and that's the way it's set up. They don't play much man-to-man defense. They play a lot of zones, which creates defense, creates turnovers, Allows big plays sometimes, and you could see that a couple of times too, but they made the plays when they had to, and that's kind of what we expect from the Rough Riders when they play football. And Trevor Harris, I think, came to play, and, and he's just showing time and time again that he's a big-time player, and he's capable of, of big-time games like that. Uh, he didn't light it up statistically necessarily, but he made all the throws that he needed to, protected the football. I think his receivers did a really good job of, of holding onto the ball. I think there was maybe one drop. Um, but a lot of sort of contested catches and big time catches from MLS Schaefer Baker Johnson Stearns had a touchdown. Um, and one of the things that we talked about leading into the game, and, and frankly, we've been talking about it for a few weeks is how do you get AJ Olette and Raquel Armstead on the roster together? And they managed to do that. And we talked about it a lot, but it wasn't really that big of a factor. Although I think AJ had a great game with obviously two touchdowns, the, the one plunge and then the one thirty yard run, um, but the running game to me wasn't the the absolute uh, thing that won this game for the Riders. But it was it was there and it was solid. And uh, yeah, Armstead didn't light it up uh, as, as we've seen before. But you know, they found a way to get both on the roster, and I think it was effective. And I don't know if it, it'll be interesting to see if they choose to to continue that going forward into Winnipeg this weekend. I, I think it shows that the Rough Riders, it, it tells the Rough Riders there tells their opponents we want to run the football, and you know what that does that makes the defense extra prepare to stop running teams running the football. They also threw little short passes to Armstead and, and to Olette that adds to their offense too, because they know they can, they can swing, swing little bubble screens or little, little short little passes to them. And both of them are great pass protectors too. Trevor Harris did, uh, got sacked once, right? I believe. So uh, they did a great job in that respect too. And I, I think that probably opened up the passing attack a little bit. As you said, Trevor Harris, uh, 27 for 33, I think 278 yards and a touchdown. That's not a bad day in a windy conditions like that. He's unbelievably accurate. He's what the leading, uh, leads all CFL quarterbacks, I think, in completion percentage and play in the postseason. And he's played in some postseason games. Uh, never won a great cup as a starter, remember, which I think he's really working towards this year and certainly seems capable of it. He seems to have ice water in his veins when it comes down to the important plays, and he threaded the needle on some beautiful passes. So I think their offense is set up pretty well the way they want it. If they were to lose Ouellette or Armstead during the game, they still have the other one in play, and that gives them that running power running attack that they want. They can also spell off the other guy just to make sure that he's fresh when he's blocking or, or when he's going out to catch a pass. So it's an interesting concept. It's, it worked pretty well for them. And if I'm getting ready to play the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, I wouldn't change that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and another interesting thing to keep an eye on will be the offensive line. Um, they played well despite losing left tackle Trevor, Trevor Reed earlier in the game. But to have the luxury of, of dressing Peter Godber as the backup and and he comes in and returns from injury and, and just picks up where he left off at center. And then obviously to have Logan Furland and, 
and Trevion Tate, uh, who then went to left tackle, and Logan Furlan played at right tackle. There was a lot of juggling after that Trevor Reed injury, but I feel mm-hmm. like they didn't really skip a beat, in my opinion, uh, despite losing their their left tackle, who's been there for every game. Yeah, they had to make, make three – poor Trevor Reed, right? Who's been – like, he and Furlan have been the only healthy guys all year, and Reed has been the guy to start every game at left tackle. Played exceptionally well. I think he should have been considered more highly for rookie of the year candidate. He's really become a, a solid – CFL player and to lose him in that game w- was tough, but they also could make those moves. It's, it's unusual. Play, teams like to put one guy to replace one guy, but the Rough Riders have it differently. Made three roster moves, but Tate, you move him to left tackle. That's the, the blind side for Trevor Harris. You move Logan Furland, who's who could play either tackle, but you move him to right tackle, which is fine. And then put P- Peter Godber, who's basically an all-star center coming into center and Logan Furlan, who can play anywhere. So it, it's a, still a decent offensive line. They provided pretty good, really good protection, to be honest, against a, a pretty good BC Lions pass rush. So uh, the fact that they played so well, despite those changes is, is a good sign. We've talked about the injuries to the offensive line. And they eventually, and this seemed to show, have helped that team because now everybody can play everywhere. They've gotten more playing time for different guys at different spots so they can make those changes and adjust them very well. That's right. Uh, And, of course, now we'll preview the West Final. Riders and Bombers, Winnipeg has been in this game six years in a row. They've hosted the last four. Um, So they're no stranger to hosting this. Won the last four, haven't they? Won, They've been yeah, in the Grey Cup the last four yeah, times, well, right? They, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, they're right. They, and they beat the Riders the last time Saskatchewan made the trip out there in 2021 in the playoffs. So I'm expecting another classic um, and obviously a, a, a big-time game this weekend uh, that'll be uh, you know with the Grey Cup trip on the line. Yeah, and the Riders haven't won there since 2018, which is quite a drought. Uh, Winnipeg selling out the game again. We, we talked a bit about the crowd, 26,100 for Saturday's game against the BC Lions. And uh, not huge, but it's tough to sell in one week. The, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have had two weeks to sell this, so it's a little bit easier. You get more people committed. Obviously, there's some more hype involved. So if they're selling it out, good for them. Uh, it didn't sound like there were many tickets available, like 250 seats available Monday morning when the when the when they kind of went on general sale. So there's not going to be a whole lot of green in that stadium uh, which gives the Winnipeg Blue Bombers an advantage. They, they play very well there, and they're playing pretty well. Despite their last game loss, they were one of the hotter teams in the CFL coming into the into the uh, stretch run. They started very slowly, but watching them build and watching Mike O'Shea, their head coach, and the, Zach Kolaris, their quarterback, get back into a groove was interesting to see because they're a veteran-laden team. They know what it takes. They know how important these games are, and they don't make mistakes in crucial moments, which I think is going to help them. And the rough, although the Rough Riders, they depend on those mistakes. So if they can force a couple, I think that can really put the advantage into Saskatchewan's back pocket. Mm-hmm. And, and, and touching back at, at home field advantage, we were up in the press box, obviously. Um, but in talking with a few people and, and fans who were at the game in the stands at Mosaic Stadium on Saturday, they said it was one of the loudest environments they had ever been a part of. And, and you could sense a little bit from where we were and, and you could hear it. And the Lions had a time count violation penalty. Corey Mace alluded to a post game. Despite 26,000, I feel like it was one of the, you know, louder environments uh, that, that that stadium has seen in, in recent years. Yeah, they were buzzing, weren't they? Right from the minute we walked into the stadium to the minute we left, it seemed like there was a buzz coming out of the out of Mosaic. And good for the fans, right? They they showed up, they were cheering loud. They they liked this football team, right? And how, how it's tough to not like them when you see what the coaching staff and uh, the players have done. I, I allude to this quite often in our discussions and when we do this podcast, Taylor, that they're a responsible, mature football team. You, you got to appreciate that, that they they realize it's nice to be able to play for a uh, community-owned franchise. They're a part of the community. They show up on their bye weeks. They're doing community events. Uh, they they face up to their mistakes, which I've seen a lot of teams and coaches around here over the decades that don't do that. So this, this team is easy to like, and I think the fans are really growing on it. Uh, I do work on the CJME phone-in show after uh, CK, uh, CKOM as well, and uh, – Mid-season, there were some people saying, oh, boy, seven-game winless skid. I don't know. Jeremy O'Day is a bad general manager. Corey Mace isn't a very good head coach. 
don't hear those calls anymore. Oh. Everybody seems to be on side. It's funny how that goes, right? Up and down the roller coaster of pro sports. But they, they've done an excellent job. And I think the, the fans of this province have really responded. I, I thought it was an okay crowd. Yes, you'd like to fill the place if you're any type of team or fan. But good for them. They, they, they were energetic. And I think the riders fed off that. That's why they always, it seemed like there was no panic among the crowd and no panic among the football team. And it showed in the final score. Prior to the last week of the season, um, obviously that sort of dud of a game against Calgary, the Riders had won four straight games. Now they've won four of their last five, um, or five of their last six, I guess, that'll be uh, heading into this game. And, and I feel like they have a lot of momentum, and that might be one thing on their side. Winnipeg, if you look at their last month, they've only played one game since October, I believe it's October 12th. They had a game on October 11th. They had a bye week. Then they beat Montreal in the final week of the regular season. Obviously, that was an important game. And then they just are coming off a of bye week. So so when you look at one team, they're going to be rested, of course, um, but they won't necessarily have that momentum of coming off a, a big emotional win and, and now coming into the West Final. They're going to be obviously waiting for the riders and, and no doubt ready. But I think one thing that Saskatchewan might have an advantage on is that momentum. Yeah, rest or momentum, what do you want, right? I, I was surprised, and, and kudos to the Rough Riders, I, uh, for bouncing back from that horrible game against Calgary. They played badly, and, and we were sounding a bit of a fire alarm. Where, you know, are they going to be able to bounce back? And, and they did, because uh, it showed in the way they played that they were they were ready to play. Um, a decade or so, maybe more than that ago, the, the second-place teams were always advancing to the Grey Cup. It seemed like they would gather the momentum. The last decade or so, it's been the first-place teams who have been winning that final after getting the bye week and then winning the final at home and moving to the Grey Cup. Uh, that seems to be the edge right now. It can change. Of course it can. It's all about preparation. It's who's healthy. The Rough Riders are getting healthier. Uh, they have some momentum now. But Winnipeg has never really lost that momentum in the second half of the season, right? So uh, what's better? Well, I, I think anybody would tell you they would rather be at home. So that's an advantage. But uh, I think a lot of teams, after they survived the semifinal, like the Rough Riders did, although they did lose an important player, but they've survived it without a lot of key injuries. Uh, they're probably pretty healthy. It was a physical game. But I think that they would say right now they've got an edge. That's the way they feel because they're on a roll. They're taking that with them. I know momentum can go up and down and, and disappear sometimes. But I think if you ask the Rough Riders right now, they're sure of themselves and they like the way things are going. They're getting back. They're in a normal routine. They're practicing again Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, traveling Friday, right? All the stuff that they're used to doing for a road trip, and they're hot, and they want to keep going at the, on the path they're on. Mm -hmm. and, and remarkably, this is the fifth meeting of the season between the two teams. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't put much stock in the preseason game, but they did play mm -hmm. in the preseason. The Riders won that first game, 19-9 in July. Bombers won the Labor Day Classic. It was a close game. Um and then the Bombers won in the Banjo Bowl in the, in the rematch a week later. So Winnipeg has the season series two to one, um, obviously not counting the preseason game. And, and I don't really even know if we can put much stock into any of that season series. It's a complete clean slate. They haven't played each other in a, in a long time. So there's nothing really carrying over from the, from the regular season into this playoff game. It'll just be a leave it all out there type of game. And, and you know, history from the regular season won't mean much, I don't think. Well, the Rough Riders were playing without Trevor Harris, too, in those yeah. games, right, in the, in the middle of the season. Not having your quarterback is a huge thing, right? We were wondering if Shea Patterson could carry the team. He did okay, but they're a better team with Trevor Harris at the end of the season, and especially the way he's playing late in the season. So I think that gets the Rough Riders back on equal footing. Uh, they, I'm sure the Rough Riders would like to say, let's forget those games, but remember Trevor Harris wasn't playing while the Bombers are saying, see, we've beaten them. But it is tough to sweep a series against a football team. The curlers say that all the time too, right? It's tough to go undefeated. It's if you play somebody twice, it's tough to beat them and beat them. It's tough to beat them the third time. So because the third time, that team that got beaten is always looking for the things they did wrong and finding what they did wrong and getting better and making those corrections. Uh, the team that won, obviously, is trying to add some things to their repertoire, which I think Winnipeg will do. But I think the Saskatchewan Rough Riders will be motivated, and they'll see what beat them the first two times around. They'll be well prepared. Winnipeg gets that extra week of preparation, which is going to be helpful, but I think the Rough Riders have learned from those past losses. Yeah, I think it'll be a great game. Um, looking forward to it. Of course, that goes Saturday evening, 5.30 kickoff. And just before, it's the East Final Toronto visiting the Montreal Alouettes for a, a trip to the great cup on the line over there as well and the hardy bowl right yes we we also should talk about that <laughs> uh, that'll be a 
I believe it's an afternoon kickoff as well. So right before the Ryder game, uh, the the Rams and the Huskies will be playing in the Canada West Championship. And amazing yeah, football weekend wasn't for it? us to be talking about the Rams and Huskies. Uh, you know, two upsets in the in the semifinals, and all of a sudden they're they're both. Uh, it's an all Saskatchewan Hardy Cup final. I think that's pretty remarkable as well. So yeah. that'll be a you know obviously entertaining game up in Saskatoon on Saturday. Good for them coming back. We were keeping track doing Riders games, weren't we? We were all paying attention and saying, "Hey, the Rams came back. Hey, the Huskies came back." So uh, a lot of momentum going there. They they played twice this year. I, I saw the game in Regina where the the Rams beat the Huskies for a change, which doesn't happen very often. It would have been seven years, I think. So uh, the Rams now feel a little bit fortified. And since we're talking football, we should mention them and, and uh, what a great game that could be too. If, uh, Saskatchewan football is in pretty good shape this year. Yeah, it's going to be an entertaining weekend. Of course, the West Final on Saturday uh, in Winnipeg. And then, uh, yes, the Hardy Cup in Saskatoon on Saturday as well. All right, that'll do it for episode number 157 of the Ryder Rummings podcast. Daryl, thanks as always for joining. And we'll talk to you next week as we preview the great cup <laughs> or wrap or wrap up the season right or one of the others so what we'll we'll could be one way or the other what, what's your quick quick thought who's gonna win it's gonna be a, a down to the wire game i honestly don't know who's gonna win i you could flip a coin honestly uh, <laughs> i'm not gonna make any bold predictions other than it's gonna come down to who makes who makes the play in the fourth quarter to yeah it. or the big mistake i think the riders might eke this one out though yep. but that, who knows good talking to you taylor take care all right see you next week